My good friend Bobby Shuler is coming up next. I hope you'll stay tuned in. You'll be inspired, encouraged. Bobby is a great minister. He pastors a great church in Orange County, the Shepherds Grove. I hope you'll stop by sometime. He'll help you become everything God's created you to be. You know, if you live in the Orange County area, we'd love to meet you. We have a great church. It's really a community of joy. If you've got kids and you want to teach them the things of God, bring them out to Shepherds Grove. We'd love to see you. And as always, God loves you and so do we. Thank you, thank you for watching today. We're so glad you're joining us here. And, uh, you know, I'm so thankful to all of you who continue to support us on television. One of the hardest parts of my job as a pastor is raising money for our TV ministry. And many of you have been so generous to support us. You know, we reach for five cents, we reach one person. I started to think about the, the mammoth task of raising money to pay for airtime. And I thought, for every one out of 100 people gave $5 or one out of every thousand people gave $50 would be able to pay for everything, no problem. And, uh, and some of you step up to that, and I'm very, I mean, can't tell you how much, uh, how thankful we are to you that every week uh, you continue to support us and keep us on the air. We're grateful to you. We know that as you join us, that God's going to continue to train you, inform you into happy and home students of Jesus. Would you join us? Church, would you join us? Hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving, and together we're going to say this creed. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. Today we're beginning a new series. It's called Lions in the Daniel Den. It's good, isn't it? It's not me. I stole it. Lions in the Daniel Den is a line from Dallas Willard. And uh, Dallas said that when Daniel, in his old age, was thrust into the lion's den, that he carried heaven in his very body. And that as he went into that lion's den, with him went all the Shekinah glory of God, all of the peace and power and Spirit of God in his body, he becomes so like spiritually dense and rich that when he entered that physical space, he turned starving lions into sleeping kitty cats. That he brought with him into that hole a tremendous sense of peace and rest. And that's where you are. You have that right now. You have that in your body. You have the power to carry into the violence and, and weirdness and brokenness of our world a sense of peace and life. You do that. Many of you don't even know it. You don't understand that as a believer, what you bring into the physical space around you. And so today we're beginning a series about affirming and teaching what it means to overflow with God's peace and life everywhere you go. You're doing it now, and you're going to do it more. Isn't that exciting? The book of Daniel, which we'll be studying in and on, uh, on and off, is, is actually in, in some ways a tragedy. It begins with the Babylonian exile. It's so important to understand the history of the Babylonian exile. This is a time in the Jewish timeline when Babylonia attacked Jerusalem. The way that it happened was prince, a young prince named Nebuchadnezzar II, uh, was responding to an Egyptian attack. So Egypt, Egypt had basically made a sort of a puppet state out of Israel and had gone north through Israel and attacked Babylon and failed. And so Babylonia decided to, to react and it started attacking back and decided to invade Egypt. And on their way, poor Israel's right in the middle, uh, they sacked Jerusalem. And... Uh, and when Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem, he took all the furnishings of the temple, and he took most of the people back to Babylon. Uh, and, and that's why it's called the exile. They were taken from their homeland. And when this happened, this young prince, Nebuchadnezzar, on his way home, actually becomes the king. His, his father dies while he's gone, so he hurries home to secure his throne. And then he begins to build his court. He's a new king, and he wants to build a retinue. 
And one of the things that they would do back then in, in Babylon is they'd wanted to, to pull basically all of the, the jewels, all the special people uh, from the various civilizations that they conquered. And what they would want to do is indoctrinate these guys and assimilate them into Babylonian culture. At this time, the Babylonian Empire is the most powerful uh, empire in the world, and Nebuchadnezzar is probably the strongest, most powerful man alive. And so he wants to build this retinue around him of terrific people. And so what does he do? He pulls these four guys that are Jews, uh, Daniel and his three friends. And they basically decide to do three things to make them Babylonian and fit for the king's court. To basically not totally strip them of their religious identity, but sort of make them not so religious and make them more Babylonian. Does that make sense? And they decide to do this in three ways. The first thing they do is they change their names. This is so important because this is what's happening to you right now, by the way. The first thing they do is they want to change their names. And what I mean by that is they want to change their identity. Uh, Daniel's name means God is my judge. But Nebuchadnezzar says, you're not Daniel any, anymore, you're Belt Belshazzar, which means Baal's prince. Uh, to his other friends, Hananiah, Hananiah means the beloved of the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar says, you're not the beloved of the Lord anymore, you're now Shadrach, which means you're illuminated by the sun god. Very pagan. He says to Mishael, which is who is God, he says, you're not Mishael anymore, you're Meshach, who is Venus. That's what Meshach means. And he says to Azariah, which means the Lord is my help. He says, you're not Azariah anymore, you're the servant of Nebo, Abednego. So these three men, their names get changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these pagan names. And Daniel's name gets changed to Belshazzar. And the first thing Babylon does to these men is he takes away their identity in God and tries to put their identity in Babylon. That's what people try to do to you. And that's why every single Sunday we say you're not what you do, you're not what you have, you're not what people say about you. You are the beloved of God and no one can take that from you. <laughs> Never lose that. So the first thing Babylon tries to do is take their dignity and honor from where it belongs in the identity of being God's beloved children and tries to put it in being the king's beloved servants. And that's not who you are. You are not servants and you are not slaves of this world. Do not let the world take your identity. Do not let it change your name. In fact, Revelation says that you have a name that is written on a white stone that God made and only he knows it and someday you will know it. And let me tell you something, that name is good. That name is good. So the first thing they do is try and change their identity. The second thing they do is they re-educate them. They say, all that stuff you learned in school in Israel, you know, some of that's good, not, a lot of it's not. And they begin to put them through an a re-education process into the worldview of Babylon. You, that's happening to us th usually through entertainment in the U.S. And depending on what country you're watching in today, you know, many of us, we have different ways in which society tries to re-educate us and make like a religious part of our life just like this hobby, this little thing on the side. But here's the education that really matters. And the third thing they did, and this was the last, and an irony about this is that this was a big honor, that King Nebuchadnezzar offered to give these four men the very food from his table. And in doing that, the symbol for, for the Jewish and Christian reader is that Nebuchadnezzar is essentially offering sustenance from the king versus sustenance from God. And the reason that choice is clear is because the food Nebuchadnezzar is offering to these four men is not kosher. It's not bagels. There's no salmon and lox. I love salmon and lox, and I love bagels, and that's kosher. And, uh, but you see, in Nebuchadnezzar's day, they just cooked whatever. And so for Jews back then, and Jews today, you can't eat bugs, you can't eat lobster, you can't eat cheeseburgers, because you can't mix milk and dairy, you can't eat uh, particularly pork, and you especially can't, you also can't drink wine unless it's made by a Jewish person, or it's certified kosher, because... Because you can't eat bugs, very often bugs are on grapes, and when those grapes are turned into wine, the bugs sort of make their way into the wine, making it unkosher. So there's all these rules. By the way, even if they were to cook kosher for these four guys, 
you, you're not even allowed to use the same like cooking ware and utensil that's been used to make non-kosher food, right? So if you cook bacon on a pan, you can't then go and cook some lamb chops, all right? So there's a big problem for these four guys. They know it's essentially going to be impossible for them to get kosher food. But for the Jews, this was so important because kosher laws were not a way of being healthy, as many people say. The, the kosher laws were meant for two things. One, to remember that Yahweh took his people out of slavery and bondage in Egypt and brought them into the promised land. And the second, and even more important, is that kosher is a symbol uh, of God's covenant. God actually creates for the Jews things that seem strange and weird so that they can never hide the fact that they're Jews. Did you catch that? They have to do Jewish Men, and I think it's a good thing, Jewish men and women had certain things like the way they eat, the way they dress, certain days they can't work, certain things they can't do that definitely will make them stand out from the society that they live in. Why? Why does he do that? He does not want them to assimilate. He wants them to change it. He doesn't want them to be thermometers. He wants them to be the thermostat. He wants them to be the ones that change the world, that don't receive the world. He sent them in as lights, not as darkness. And it is too easy for us as Christians today, it was too easy then to forget the fact that we're supposed to be set apart. We're not supposed to assimilate. We're supposed to love. We're supposed to be gentle. We're supposed to be kind. We're supposed to be listeners. We're supposed to be healers. But God has called you to be a thermostat, not the thermometer, to be the change agent, not the one who has changed. And kosher stuff, as funny as this sounds, kept the Jewish people the Jewish people. It kept them separate. And so when they're offered this thing to eat this food from the table, they're like in a tough spot, right? Because it's a big honor. I mean, the king offers them food from his very table. And they have to say no. They have to basically choose who they're going to offend. Either they're going to offend the most powerful, wealthy, influential man in the world, or they're going to offend God. Who would, you, who would you offend? I think too often we kind of think God will get over it. He'll be fine. <laughs> right? I'll just do it this one time. And for them, this is just such a part of their identity. This kosher thing is such a big deal that they literally risk their lives uh, to not eat bacon. I love bacon. <laughs> and, and, but really, they, they know, they recognize that this is non-negotiable. So even though they receive the names and they receive the education, this one thing they can't deny, the covenant of God. So what do they do? They put a plan together and they tell this kind of like overseer, they say, look, we can't eat this food. It's not kosher. This is against our ways and our God. Just feed us vegetables and water. There is no vegetable, by the way, that is not kosher and no fruit that's not kosher. So they're like, just give us vegetables and we'll be cool. And the guy says, I can't give you vegetables because if I give you just vegetables and water, you're going to get all withered and you're going to look skinny and horrible and all of your counterparts are going to look buff and awesome. And I'm going to have to report to Nebuchadnezzar for this. And they said, put it to the test. Give us 10 days and see who does better. Of course, with modern science, we know who looked better, right? I mean, those four guys had abs, pecs. They look at 10 days of vegetables and water. They're looking awesome. And that's what happened. And what was great about that is by, is by honoring God... And even risking their lives, their reputations, risking chains by honoring God, by standing out, by being a light, by being faithful to to their principles, that actually caused them, you see later in the story, to be elevated in society. And they weren't like judging other people. They weren't saying Nebuchadnezzar is bad or these other guys are bad. They were saying this is what we're called to do. This is who we are. We have to stand up for our principles and what we believe. I'm sorry if you don't understand. And because of their faithfulness to the principles in God's covenant, God elevated them to successful position. You are like Daniel. You have stood up for your principles. You have valued God's covenant. You have valued his his promises. And very often you feel, sometimes you feel forgotten. You You feel like you're left alone. I promise you, you're not alone. The light that shines in you is the very spirit, life, and heartbeat of God. Heaven is in you. And you have lived every day faithful to God's covenant and principles. Sometimes you've suffered for it. Sometimes your relationships, you've lost chips in your relationships. Sometimes you've struggled in your friendships. Or even some of you in your family, you, know, you get picked on by family members because of your faith. God sees that and honors that. 
God sees that. And I know it's hard. It's hard sometimes to stand out and to be a light. But God sees that and he honors it. You stand out and you stand up for God. That's what you do. I'm proud of you. That's good. It's hard to do in our world. It's very hard to do in our world because all of us carry this fear of being an outsider. This fear of, uh, of offending others, of hurting others, of, of being talked about, of being pulled away. But, but very often we forget that some of us have become slaves. We need to belong so much that we've, we've abandoned what really matters to us. But not you. You're that person that goes into a room and you change the whole environment. You don't even know it. You bring peace and life and light and encouragement into every room you go in. That when you walk into a space, you actually bring heaven in. And you don't know this maybe, but people feel it as you come into that room. That's wonderful. I, I think that many people are just so afraid of standing out and standing apart. And that's so powerful when you're not afraid to be ostracized, to be picked on, to be bullied, to not be invited anymore because you pray with people when they're hurting or you share your faith or you read your Bible at your lunch break. When when you put God first in your life, things go better. Don't worry about offending everyone. Just worry about offending God. And if you do that, you're going, to be real, you're going to be much better at actually loving and caring for people when they're hurting and suffering. You already are. Lately, Hannah and I had the wonderful privilege. You know, recently, we were in Washington, D.C., and we were honored by the Dr. King family to stand with them at the Washington Mall. And uh, we actually uh, washed the feet of the Dr. King family in a ceremony of repentance for the church not supporting the civil rights movements in, in, the, in the 1960s. It was a very powerful experience. It was snowing. There were all sorts of colors and races and backgrounds. All of us interceding for the nation. We were praying for lots of things, but this was the, my highlight. And the, the, uh, Dr. King's niece and daughter uh, gave me this uh, uh, stole. It represents the reconciliation between races within the kingdom of God. It was very powerful. And after that, Hannah and I had the joy of going to um, a church in uh, Richmond, Virginia... Uh, by Victor Torres. I don't know if you remember that name. He, he was uh, in the story of the cross and the switchblade. And, um, uh, and he has another movie coming out called Victor. But he was this young guy, Puerto Rican guy in New York City that was moving drugs. And he got saved and overcame his heroin addiction. And then moved to Richmond, he and his wife Carmen, and started these uh, houses to bring men and women out of drug addiction and off the street. Out of that was birthed this church, and I was invited to speak at the church. It's now a mega church. It's called uh, New Life International, and if you live in Richmond, check it out. You'll, you'll enjoy it. And Hannah and I were there in the front row, and there's like this front altar area. And, and, the, and all of a sudden, these, as the worship was going on, these women uh, came to the front. And in front of everyone, without a care in the world, began to just do whatever the Lord called them to do. I mean, they were just some dancing, some weeping, some on their knees, some like this on the altar. And there's kind of two types of people that do this kind of thing. There's the the one type is the one with the ribbons that wants everybody to see them. It wasn't that type. And there's the second type, and that's the person that has been redeemed from so much that they can't help but pour out their life and their heart to God. After the church service, we found out that all of those women that were in the front were women who had been saved through this Mercy House program. Women who were at death's door, women who were completely addicted to heroin, women who were on the street, women who had been sold in prostitution, and they had been completely redeemed by the saving power of Jesus Christ. And you could, you could feel, you could literally feel by standing near them the power of God in their lives. And, and I remember standing there in the front row looking at these women thinking, I'm a pastor and I don't have the heart for God that these women have. Lord, give that to me. Lord, make me like this redeemed prostitute. Make me like this redeemed drug addict. I want to be more like them and less like some of the heroes that I was taught about in my seminary. These are who the kingdom of God is for. People who 
have been saved from so much. They don't care if the world sees how grateful they are to a loving God. I want to be more like that, don't you? Yeah. Well, as you know, I may not be that way, but you are. You are. And maybe you're at a time in your life where you haven't been that way as much, but it's burning. You see, this, the soul that has been redeemed, it's like a pilot light. You know, it's always going. Sometimes you just got to turn the gas on. Turn it on. Let it, let it go. Let it go. Burn for the Lord. John Wesley said, if you burn a flame, people will come from far to watch you burn. No, that's not right. <laughs> he said, live your life aflame and people will come to watch you burn. That's what it was. They lived from their first love. And many of you are like, man, I remember my first love. I, I remember my heart for God. And uh, man, the Lord has not left you. You are not farther from God than you were before. It's all in your head. You're just as close to God as you always were. You, you are a flame for God. You are a light for God. I mean, like, you don't know about my sin. You don't know about my skeleton. You don't know about my mistakes. God's atoned for that. Receive grace. Receive forgiveness. You are not saved by works. And let your light burn for people. You do. You let your light burn. And when you, when you see, you know, when you see like someone crying in a Starbucks line, you stop and you pray with him. I know some of you said, I feel awkward to ask somebody who's hurting, can I pray with you? If you feel awkward asking them, can I pray with you, you're the best person to ask that question. People that don't feel awkward about asking, can I pray for you, are usually a bit odd, to be honest with you. <laughs> but if it feels a little awkward and you say, can I pray with you, you're going to pray with them just the right way. Because you're going to understand all those social norms about like, not like hugging and rocking them as you pray for a complete <laughs> or whatever, you know. I can't, I can't impress that one point enough. The more awkward you feel in different ministry type things for people, the better you are for that position because you'll understand the various cultural, societal needs of that person and not push them away. You'll draw them into God. So by saying, can I pray for you? 99% of people will say yes. You're not going to be weird. You'll, you'll pray for them and intercede for them and it will mean the world to them. And you do. And that's true of sharing your faith. That's true of helping the poor. That's true of, of, uh, of mentoring. Uh, and you are doing these things in your life. You are living out loud. You're speaking up in defense of others. You are not participating in gossip in the workplace or in your school. You apologize when you make a mistake. Of course you do. Your dignity is not rooted in having to prove anything to anyone. You're completely rooted in the dignity of God. And that's why you're living every day a flame, a light, and at peace. The world needs you to be bold and to be you and to be a man or woman after God's own heart. It needs you to continue to be a light. You are a lighthouse. You know, when the, when the weather is good and you live in some town with a lighthouse in it, it's like, oh, there's this pretty little lighthouse there. Isn't that so pretty? But when the storm rages and when the waves crash, it's amazing how the look of a lighthouse changes dramatically. No longer is it this pretty little cottagey Victorian thing. All of a sudden, it stands as like a citadel, a shining sign of safety, and it guides ships in a storm into safe harbor. And the stronger the storm rages and the bigger the waves crash, the stronger the lighthouse is and the stronger it looks and the brighter it burns. Lighthouses are not worried about waking the neighbors. The purpose of a lighthouse is to guide people into safe harbor. And if it gets darker, a lighthouse burns brighter. If the weather gets rougher, the lighthouse gets stronger. You are a lighthouse. You're a lighthouse. And, and you feel it. I feel it too. The, the spiritual temperature of this world is stormy and raging and dark and gray. You need to burn. You need to shine. And you need to guide people into safe harbor. And you're doing it. You are guiding people every day into safe harbor. Sometimes being a light of the world is like being a light in a dark room. It's like going to your brother or sister's uh, bedroom when they're sleeping and like pulling on the shade. Just, you know, and the light fills the room. And then your brother or sister goes, you know. <laughs> Sometimes when you pull the shades open in a dark room, people get angry. People don't like it. People feel uncomfortable. 
But sometimes it's exactly what you have to do to wake up the people you love. You have to let the light shine. Do not hide it under a bushel. Many of you, you've been picked on because of your belief or because of your faith. You have family members, frenemies who uh, make fun of you because of your faith or because you go to church, because you read your Bible, because you share your faith. Let me just tell you something. It's training. It's training. The more great you're doing for God, the more people are going to go out of their way to criticize you. Do you know any wonderful women or men of God who have no critics? I already know you don't. Everybody, everybody who's doing great things for God has people who are criticizing them. The enemy doesn't just let you shine your light. You don't understand that, right? He's going to try and take your identity. He's going to try and re-educate you. He's going to try and snuff you out. He's going to try and mock you. He's going to try and beat you. He's going to try and bully you. But you're going to continue to shine bright because that's who you are. That's who you are. And the greatest thing about you is that the way you do these things is gentle, calm, and peaceful. Everything else is raging, like the like house in the storm. Everything else, all the waves are crashing. You're just <laughs> gentle, calm, empathetic, kind, listening. Do not shove religion down people's throats. Just be you, and like a lighthouse, ships will be drawn to you as ships are drawn into a harbor. And God will bless you, even in secular positions of authority, as he blessed Daniel. And that is great. Be a light. Be God's chosen one. Fulfill your calling. You don't have to be shy. Boldly have courage to do what is right. And as you do that, the other good people that are near you will will have the courage to do good as well because you had the courage to take the first step. I'm so proud of you. You're doing great. And continue to let that light shine. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you that you're here. And I pray for everyone who is listening, Lord, that if they don't have this light in their heart, that today they would receive salvation. God is so good. And his mercy endures forever. And his love is wider than your imagination. In Jesus' name, receive the forgiveness of sins. If you're watching on TV or if you're here, simply say, I receive. receive. Amen. And we do receive it, Lord. We receive your love, your favor, and your life. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're so glad that you've watched today. You know, here at Shepherd's Grove, we believe in the dignity of every human being. So often people in life just feel battered down by criticism, competition, and all of the things that sort of wither our soul. We're in business to get out there and encourage you and encourage others to know God's love and to be restored and ready for the next day. If you wanna partner with us and help us reach more people, it only takes 25 cents to to sponsor one person a month. That's it, that's all it costs. For every dollar we get, it goes out, we buy more airtime, we reach more people, and we could really use the help. Please consider, pray, think about it, and remember as always, God loves you and so do we.